jetzt mal. Okay. Gut. Uh, yeah. Have we got, can you share your screen? Is that going to work? Okay. Oh, now go full screen. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me, Katya, everybody. I'm so glad to see you and look forward to visiting later. Katya and I know each other for a long time and we have very common interests in mathematics and applications, so I'm sure we can work something out. Then, so I, uh, I'm going to present to you our uh, latest paper in a long uh, research program that I've been following since 2011 nearly. And uh, there is a couple of papers online, but I want people to read this last one, which is called Vector Space Semantics for Lambeck Calculus with soft, soft exponentials, obviously, you can't copy this, but I can send this to you later. This is a um, this appeared in Conference Logical Aspects of Computational Linguistics 2021. It's joint work with Lachlan McFeed, Hadi Vasni, uh, who are my PhD students. And it's also on the archive. Uh, so you can look it up later. Then um, I've given this talk like a more interesting title called Reference Resolution with models of structural logics and vector space semantics. Um, because, so this lambda calculus with soft sub-exponentials is obviously a model of structural logic and we use this logic to um, resolve co-reference in natural language. And these I'll give examples, anaphora ellipsis are examples. Without the modalities, you can use lambda calculus for normal sentential analysis. And then the vector space semantics has been a very, very nice bridge uh, to machine learning and advances in deep neural networks. So it's been really nice. Okay, so uh, here is the general idea. So um, we work alongside this natural language processing pipeline, you know? So we want to sort of fill in all boxes of this pipeline. You're given an input, uh, which can be, you know, a natural language a piece of text, it can be conversational text, text, it can be written text. And the ideal world is that you would have an automatic parser, and you run it on the text, you get the grammatical and discourse, the structure within sentences and between sentences. So this would be, for example, three structures coming from phrase structure grammars of Chomsky. And then you would then send this grammatical structure into a semantic analyzer, which as output will give you semantic representations. After a long time, until very recent developments, people worked with first order logic semantics, higher order logic semantics even, on the rightmost side of the pipeline. As output, you, could, you get formulae of logic. Uh, then it turned out uh, that the passage between um, grammars and first order logic is beautifully doable through Montague semantics. It's, it's one of these miracles of science, the extremely compositional set of rules that given a tree will give you a nice semantics very nicely. But the problem with it was that it didn't have really applications. What people wanted and what turned out to work later is that you have statistical representations for words, sentences and text documents of natural language, you can build representations using these statistics in terms of vectors. For example, a vector would be a probability distribution. And so then once you've done this, you end up in a nice space, easy to define an inner product. Then you can do many tasks with it. For example, uh, while you're calculating the degree of semantic similarity of these pieces of text, they don't have to be both words or sentences, they can have different grammatical structures. And this is doable by working within your space. Study the geometry of the space. The easiest thing you can do is to calculate the cosine of the angle between these vectors. And this will give you a very nice intuitive notion of similarity. And this is what linguists have been doing recently, working on the statistical representations on the right-hand side. Uh, so they, nobody then wants to work with this nice first order logic 
uh, formula that we know. But then the problem was that we didn't know how to work through the pipeline. You didn't know how to uh, have a grammatical representation such that it would translate uh, into these vector spaces, Boyo and automatic semantic analyzer. Um, if you then analyze the structure of the text using Chomsky and you get trees, then people didn't know how to translate these trees to statistical representations to vectors, for example. And this is what we've been addressing in this research program, filling these boxes. And obviously, uh, we've worked with many different grammat grammatical systems. But obviously, what I want to show you today is how models of structural lambda calculus, lambda calculus with soft, soft exponentials, can beautifully parse your sentences. You get proof trees as grammatical structures. And then we here have uh, an engine which we call compositional vector space semantics. People call it tensor semantics, type driven semantics. Some people call it disco cut or distributed compositional categorical. But the important thing is that then we fill this paper pipeline and with vectors on the right hand side. And so I'll start by talking about first vector semantics for natural language and then why do we need to be uh, go compositional and how. Okay. So the idea is that is that uh, we've got a data oriented view on language. There is large corpora of data around uh, on the internet, very easily accessible, and these are increasing day by day. For example, Google has this project of scanning all published books and magazines. Uh, I, I guess a couple of years ago, they had gone up to 25 uh, million uh, volumes. Then there is this ever daily growing Google News Corpus, uh, news articles from 50,000 different news resources. Wikipedia, uh, lots and lots of articles in many different languages. Before this all came out, people work with the British National Corpus in English, 100 million words, very easy, queryable online. They still work with this. Or dumps of crawls of UK web domains or uh, web domains in other languages, Italian, French, German, together with Wikipedia. So this would sort of restrict your corpora uh, because Google News and Google Books are extremely huge. So the idea is that you've got all this data, it looks like this, right, incomprehensible to humans, uh, or like this. And, uh, and uh, a theory called distribution semantics, uh, which leads to statistical representations, knows very well how to make sense of that. But the idea behind these semantics came from Zoelic Harris, uh, who was Chomsky's supervisor, and the linguist called Ferris, uh, who worked in SOAS in Bloomsbury, around the corner from me. So Harris and Ferris said uh, that the meaning of a word depends on its context. So Harris specifically said, if A and B, two words like Oculus and eye doctor, um, the, the A and B, if they have almost identical environment contexts, we say that they are synonyms. And indeed, he draw this conclusion from many observations of the coin, Oculus and eye doctor, they have similar meanings, they occur almost in the same environments. Of course, this notion of synonymity was later generalized to semantic similarity because antonyms do also occur in identical environments and so do hypernyms and hyponyms. But what is preserved is semantic similarity between these words. And first said something much more philosophical that you shall know a word by the company that it keeps. And I've got an example here. So I suppose you've never uh, seen the word apricot. Uh, but you're given a context, and here's your context. Apricot is a summer fruit. Uh, Turkey is amongst its larger producers. Uh, some people like apricot jams, but um, take the half apricot with two minutes and dip them sugar. So these all come from real corporate, by the way. And if you didn't know the meaning of apricot, try to imagine this is mass cloud, you could have guessed that this is some kind of obviously a summer fruit, you've made jams out of it. It's quite popular to eat, comes from Turkey, et cetera. So they would get a very good idea what this would be about. And that's how people uh, make sense of this large corporate of text. 
many years later, after Harris and Press came up with these ideas, this was formalized in the form of vector spaces. And this is as follows. You build a large uh, term term uh, matrix, uh, this is called the co-occurrence matrix. On the columns of this matrix, as you can see here, you put uh, what's called context words. All the words, for example, all the canonical forms of the words from the dictionary of English. First one is art back and then you carry on. And then on the rows, um, you put what's called target words, words of interest, words in whose meaning you are interested. And then you count how many times each target word, every card occurred in the context of, a very simple context is uh, a neighboring window, three words to the left, three words to the right, five words to the left, five words to the right. Of all the context words, when Africa didn't occur in the neighborhood of our track computer data, it did occur with pinch and with sugar. So you put this raw frequency numbers, you populate your um, matrix. Uh, even directly, you can then now imagine a vector space whose bases are the columns and whose points are, so whose bases are the context words and whose points are the target words. For example, the vector of apricot will be one with lots of zeros except for a one at pinch and a one at sugar. Uh, the vector of digital, you see the co-occurrences there and you get a nice uh, vector for it. If you carry it on for information, you'd get a vector and this would be close to digital because obviously they occurred in the same context. Uh, there are many different ways of normalizing these raw co-occurrences and uh, like likelihood, positive versions of them, shifted versions of them, which I won't go through, but obviously you can make this much more sophisticated than just being raw numbers. You can normalize it using different norms and so on. Okay, one major task this was used for was this ambiguation. And if you have the word draw, uh, you don't know what it means. It has any of uh, many meanings, for example, uh, drawing a card, as in a horse draw a card, pulling a card, or drawing with the pencil and paper, as in sketching. And if you then build vector for draw, uh, based on the corpus you worked with, then you, you can disambiguate the meaning of draw. If it's closer to pull, you know that it's a pull meaning of draw. And if it's closer to sketch, you know that it's the sketching meaning of draw. So that's an idea for an application. And in fact, these days there are um, ready-made packages, for example, spaces where I use, uh, which give you, you can you choose your corpus um, and then it quickly goes and builds vectors and you can get nice visualizations for them. Cat and dog being close to each other apart from car. Then uh, compositionality comes in when you move from words to phrases and sentences. So here we've described nicely and beautifully how you build a vector for words, but what about a sentence? Uh, let's be cheeky and consider the sentence, a child drew a horse. Um, so if you put pose this question to a uh, computational linguist like around 20 years ago, they would say, what is the big deal? Uh, you have a vector for child, a vector for horse, and a vector for draw, and you just add them. And this is indeed compositional, but it's very rough. Because if I take the other meaning of draw, like a horse through a child, that's like a horse pulling the child sitting in a car. And if I sum the vectors of the words within these two sentences, I'll get identical vector semantics, which is undesirable, right? So that's why you need composition indeed, because you want to work with the words within a sentence to get the meaning of the sentence, but you want something much more sophisticated that, that uh, popular operations on vector space like addition, like point by multiplication. And ideally, um, so this was the open question we worked on, you want to have a grammatical structure for the sentence. So remember the pipeline, you should start with a grammatical structure, the grammatical structure of your sentence, a horse drew a small child, which would look like a proof tree, like a tree. And then you want to translate this into vector spaces, mapping the structure of the grammatical reductions, right? rather than just flattening the structure and just adding the ingredients. 
And this is what we can do using Lambert calculus. And Lambert suggested this in 1950s. He came up with a sequence calculus. Um, it's a very simple sequence calculus. We've got one main operator dot, um, which is the comma of your calculus. So this is the last rule. You've got dot left. It just says comma is uh, pretty printing for dot. Then on the right hand side, you see some linear logic coming in. If I have a dot on the right hand side, then I need two separate contexts on the left, comma one and comma two. One should give me the first uh, term A, and the other one should give me the other term B. You have to split your context. Um, you've got uh, two implications, forward slash, as we have here, second line up, backward slash, so I feel third line up, and these are implications. Now, because my dot is not commutative, then I get the sort of one implication, two implications. So if you want to sort of map this to linear logic, this is multiplicative, non-commutative intuitionistic linear logic, really. So this came, Lambert came up with this in the 50s, much before linear logic came to become popular and famous. Uh, and still non-commutative linear logic is not very common, but that this is the logics we need for natural language. So um, because I want to talk about coreference, then I would I immediately introduce the model version of Lambert calculus. Now, again, there are many different model versions of Lambert calculus. What we need is this specific one. And the most recent version of this was introduced in each car uh, 2020. And uh, the idea here is that, like we do in linear logic, you introduce the bank, as you can see, and you sort of intuitively say, okay, in linear logic, this is some structural logic, uh, as you see before here, I do not have any contraction or weakening, right? Uh, but then I allow for bank formulae to be contracted or weakened. Here, what we need for natural language turned out, and I'm amazed how these people, Kanovich, because of Nikom and Shadow, how did they think of this without having any motivations? It's exactly something like this. You need a bank operator for copying, so you are low contraction. In this very specific form, look at the left rule. If you have a bank formula on the bottom, you go up eliminating the bank and you produce n copies. Each uh, logic, which so sort of lambda calculus with sub, sub exponentials, is called SLLM, so we abbreviate it to SLLM. Each SLLM comes with a bound K on the number of times you can unfold your bank. So if I set my bank to be and my bound to be five, then this n is any number up to five. So I can copy bank four times from bank a, I go to four times a on the top, but I cannot go to six. So the maximum number of copies is five. It's really nice. So if I bank a formula, it means that I can uh, contract it, I can use contraction on it at most k times. And indeed, the right rule says uh, if you have a bang on the left, you can drop it, but only if you have a bang on the right as well. Then what we needed was a notion of permutation. Now, uh, it would be possible to have the same bang modality to bo both copy, contract, and, and to permute. So Lambert calculus in general is not commutative, but for coreference resolution, you need commutativity. So you want to be able to commute some formulae Incidentally, those will be the formulae you copied, but however, it's neater if uh, you separated these two modalities. So we introduced a new modality, NABLA, for permutation. So every NABLA formula, NABLA A, for example, in the left rule, um, if you have NABLA A and gamma two, then you can permute the drop, the, oh, sorry, look in the last line, look at the PERM rules, PERM and PERM prime. Let's look at pair. So you have nabla gamma two, you go up and you permute gamma two and nabla. Similarly, on the other side. Um, any questions about the logic so far? I don't think so, no questions here. Oh, okay, great. 
So here you've got, as you see, like controlled copying. Why controlled? Because I'm marking my phone. In the no, no, maybe just copying. a quick question. So this Nabla, is it something that appeared in other logic? So it's something completely new uh, for this particular paper for SLLM? No. Is permutation, uh, a symbol for permutation, new, essentially like a new modality for permutation. Yes, exactly. I haven't seen any logic uh, any non-commutative logic that with controlled modalities. So, so if you have seen it, let me know. I hadn't come across it before the work of Kalorich and colleagues because um, Kalorich and Kuzansov and Shedrov also around 2017, they had something which they called Lambe calculus with a relevant modality. And there they had only one modality, just one bank, which would copy and permute, you know, but they didn't have a bank bound on it. So the logic was undecidable. And in 2020, they introduced this following soft linear logic. They introduced the bound. For some reason, they separated the modalities. And this logic is now decidable because obviously there's a bound on copy. Other than that, I haven't seen. It would be really interesting to see. And also you said that you permute only things that you copied, but from the rules, it doesn't, the, the copying uh, operation and permutation don't, don't seem to be related looking at the rules. No, well done. Uh, in the previous version of the logic, the character's logic, there was only one modality for copying and moving, you know? Okay. Uh, but here they separated them. However, in the natural language examples, we've come across Whenever you copy is for a reason, and that's to move it somewhere else and resolve it with, for example, coreference. And it would be nice to actually find out applications where copying and moving are separate from each other. Because you see, you see there's absolutely no interaction between these two modalities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does sorry, what does moving mean to man, I, what does moving mean in terms of natural language? I understand. Oh, yes, I have examples. Let me show you. Here's this example. Okay. okay, so normally natural language, especially a language like English, is fixed word order. You don't want to move things. You don't want to permute because if you are, you want to say John slept, but you don't want to say slept John. So John slept, uh, if you multiply the type of John with the type of slept using the dot of the logic, this should not be equal to the multiplication of type of slept as, as John. Absolutely non-commutativity is necessary. But here's an example where you need copying and moving. So John slept his snort. Now, if we just pass John slept blindly, uh, then we've lost John. We, John is an argument, we give it to slip, I'll show you how. Then we lose it, then we come across he, or what are we gonna do? No, we have no choice other than just treating he like a normal argument as if it was a noun, give it to snore and pass it like that. There's no way to connect he to John and connecting he to John is called coreference resolution. This type of coreference resolution, when you have a pronoun that the pronoun is after the noun is called anaphora. If the pronoun was before the noun, he snored. John was the person who snored. That would be cataphora. But in general, people use anaphora for both. But this is an example of coreference resolution. So what do we do here? First, we have to somehow guess that we need to copy John in this in this discourse. Is easy. I see John slept his snore. I know it's John who has to be going to his. So uh, you know, I decorate type of John. Usually I would just put N for noun phrase. Now I've decorated it with a NABLA. So formula of the logic are grammatical types. N is noun phrase, S is, S is sentence. Now I know that uh, John is a special type that can be referred to. So I, I'm decorated with NABLA. I know that it has to be permuted. I'll show you now why. And with the bind, because I know that it has to be copied. Now, let's see why do we need copying? We do contraction, go up. Now, my bound, let's say, is 100. But in this instance, I want to use it only twice. So from bank, NABLA N, I get two copies of NABLA N, right? That was why, that, that's the bank left rule. Eliminate bank, get two copies of A. That's exactly what I'm doing. Eliminate bank, get two copies of NABLA, a, NABLA N. Then I permute because one of these NABLA Ns has to go before he, right? So from the beginning of the sentence, this has to go 
to after the verb of the first sentence. The two nablas were first before m backslash s. Now one of them has been permuted and goes to after m backslash s. Why? Because now then I can give the nabla n to the type of he, which is nabla n backslash n. So these are implications, right? The type of an adjective is something that needs as an argument, something that is movable, something with a nabla type. And then these two nablas cancel out and I get an n out. The first nabla stays. And then, oh dear, I, I have to cancel it with an implication type n backward slash s, which doesn't have a nabla. But thank goodness I've got a nabla left rule, which allows me to drop nabla when I go up. So now I've dropped my nabla and then n and n backward slash n. Think of n and n implication. S cancel out modus ponens. This modus ponens is implicable in the left slash rules. And then I get to the axioms. But do you see the general idea? If I have a noun to which I'm going to refer later, I want that noun time to be copyable and movable. I hope everybody is nodding. Yeah, we've got at least some nods in the oh, okay, lovely. At least some nods in the room. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Okay, obviously the main problem here is like, what do you know, how do you know what to decorate uh, and how many, how do you know how many copies do you need, but I think these can be learnable using algorithms, I don't think they're hard problems. Then uh, let's look at another co-reference example, so these guys are called ellipses. So you have Andy plays violin, A dot does two, so does two here is, plays the role of your um, pronoun, but it's called an ellipsis marker. And what it refers to is playing violin. So Andy plays violin, Ada plays violin, but you're lazy to say Ada plays violin, you say Ada does too. Now, in this instance, if you look at the, the we've got our N, what we're copying is plays violin. So I'm going to put a bang in the type of, I bang and a nabla in the type of play violin which is n backwards slash s. And this is the one that go up, getting rid of the bank two copies, and then I just move one of them. Now, those two is a function that needs something that was permuted, nabla, which, which one? It has to be of type verb, n backwards slash s. If you give it to it, it will give you something of type n backwards slash s which this n is the, then gets canceled out with this n, is the second n from the left, the third n from the left, which is a dot. So you can go do a lot here, because you, you have, so I'll, I'll actually go another example. Here is one of the uh, tricky examples. Uh, it has an ambiguity in it. Philippa likes her dad, a dot does too. Who does Ada like, Philippa's dad or her own dad? So if Ada likes her own uh, Philippa's that, then this is called strict reading. And then you have to decide what to copy and move. But if Ada loves uh, her own that, this is called sloppy reading and you have to copy and move something else. A grammatical system is uh, said to be sufficient if you can, if it can reflect ambiguities that are present in natural language and indeed, in this model, Lambert calculus, for the strict reading, we get a proof tree. And for the sloppy reading, we get another proof tree. It's a much larger one. You see the D of that gets replaced by this soft proof tree. But you could resolve this kind of ambiguities on the other side of the grammar. OK, uh, so that's for co-reference resolution. Many other examples exist, like I put the CD on the computer, it broke, uh, the, war, uh, the fish ate the worm, it was tasty, uh, the police uh, denied permit to demonstrate those because they were violent, all these things you can do. Now, um, without the modalities, obviously, you can do many things inside sentences if you don't want to copy on. Now, what about the vector semantics side? How do you assign vectors? This is actually turned out to be really easy. So to the atomic formulas of this logic, atomic formula A goes to a finite dimensional vector space 
on the field of reals. Actually, the field doesn't really matter. And we are now studying to see if final dimensionality matters. Certainly, it makes many things easier, but things may be also possible uh, in infinite dimensions. But then I guess an atomic formula A goes to a finite dimensional vector space. So that's its semantics. If you have the dot product of two formulae, so then you define it obviously for complex formulae by induction. So the semantics of something which is multiplied by something else, A dot P, is the te tensor product of the vector spaces of each of them, tensor product of the vector space associated to A with tensor product of the vector space associated to B. For the bank, we uh, work with something which is called a truncated Fox space. So K is the K zero is the bound that you fix for each logic. Nabla becomes identity because vector spaces are commutative. A tensor B is uh, isomorphic to B tensor A. Um, what about the left and right implications? A backward slash B goes to the dual space of vector space associated to A. So that's A star the star of vector space associated to A tensor B. And similarly, B forward slash A goes to dual space of A tensor B. What is a truncated over a truncated Fox space? You know, a Fox space over V is where you take, um, you have your field R, then you do take its uh, byproduct direct sum with the vector space itself, with two tensors of the vector space, with three tensors of vector space at infinitely many times for a normal Fox space. It's like a closed object. But for a truncated Fox space, because we've fixed this bound K0, you only take uh, the tensor products to the level K0. So if K, K0 was three, you would have R, uh, direct sum V, direct sum V tensor V, direct sum V tensor V tensor V. As you can see, this gives you the copying ability. Okay, so formally, we've got this semantic map between the formulae and proofs of our logic, SSLM, to FT vect, which we take to be finite dimensional vector spaces over reals and linear maps on them. As you saw, the semantic map sends formulae to finite dimensional vector spaces and then sends proofs to linear maps over these vector spaces. Now, I don't have time to show how this works for proofs, but it works as you can imagine, and it's also in the fact. But now, uh, what we get as a theoretical result is the proof of soundness of this semantics. SLLM is sound in vector spaces, where the definition of this map. Uh, and I would like to show you some examples of, so we've got two examples, I think, for the soundness of the rule. So let's look at forward slash right rule. This is one of the interesting ones. So you have gamma A uh, derives B, gamma derives B forward slash A. Now on the semantic side, I've got a linear map from tensor product uh, of vector space of gamma and vector space of A, right? Comma was tensor product to the vector space associated to B from gamma tensor A to B. On the bottom side, now I need to derive lambda RF, another uh, linear map, that sends something in gamma to something in B tensor dual space of A, Y, because the semantics of B forward slash A was B tensor dual of A, if you remember. So look here, B forward slash A has semantics A star tensor B. So here I've got B forward slash A, and I, I go to A star tensor B. Now, what is this map? These maps are all easily obtainable. Lambda R of F, I apply it to something in gamma and something in A. So little gamma in big gamma, little A in big A. What does it give to me? It just tensors gamma and A and then applies F to them. And by definition, this will end up to be in B. Really easy. The interesting uh, rule is our contraction copying rule. So I've copied the rule on the right hand side here, find L. Semantically, uh, we have a linear map, right, from the tensor product of the vectors on the top. And we are looking for another linear map CN of F that takes into account 
semantics of bang A, which is the truncated Fox space, TK0 of A. And what is that is just the projection at the end level. So if I just compose F, identity on delta one, identity on delta two, and projection on the truncated Fox space, then I get to A tensors with itself n times. This turned out to be extremely useful. Uh, although we are copying and we are in linear spaces, we only work with linear maps on these vector spaces. Copying would have seemed absolutely impossible because it's a nonlinear map. But by moving to Fox spaces and projecting, you're actually working with a linear version. This solved a lot of our problems. Uh, so we're also always interested in categorical semantics. So we have a categorical semantics, so you can develop a syntactic category out of the syntax of SLLM, again, using this, the standard constructions. What you'll get is a monoidal poiclos category, poiclos because you are not commutative, so each implication corresponds to one of the closures with two endofunctors, M for multiplexing, copying, P for permutation, and they have to satisfy some properties. For example, for multiplication, you have sigma n. Now, as you can see, you, you copy, then you've got natural transformations and natural isomorphism as usual for permutation. And the categorical semantics, is obviously, as you know, the atomic formula of the logic go to objects of the category. Complex formulas are defined very similar to the vector spaces with tensor and left and right home sets. So these are then by closure equivalent to dual spaces because they're infinite directional vector spaces. Then there is a canonical isomorphism between the dual space and the space. Sorry, it's not canonical, but there is a way of going back and forth. Delta, the bang goes to uh, functor M for multiplexing, nabla goes to functor P for permuting. And now with this categorical semantics, because it's obviously the category of the syntax, we can show that SLLM is sound and this time also complete, which wasn't true for vector spaces. Okay, I'll show, go over quickly two derivations just to give you an idea how now, so from the proof tree, we can now get a vector semantics. So um, take our sentence, John slept his snort. So John obviously comes from a truncated Fox space over the space of nouns, that's capital N. So it, capital N is a finite dimensional vector space you are assigned to lowercase n, the type of noun phrases. Similarly, sleeps, if you remember, was n backward slash s. This goes to n star s, and so on and so forth. Do you have a map with the type of the top part of the slide? And very easily you can define it at the level of elements to be sleep applied to John, tensor, snort applied to he applied to John. So it covers exactly the intuition we have. Sleep is something that takes John and returns a sentence. He is something that takes the other copy of the John and returns something that is applicable to snore. So you have two sentences here, John snoring and John sleeping, which is exactly what you want. It's not John snoring and a he, uh, John sleeping and a he is snoring, it's really John sleeps and John snores. For the ellipsis case, like um, Lisa plays uh, the guitar, John does too, a very similar story. You set the type of your map, pick elements of the spaces, apply the semantics and you get John plays the guitar and Lisa also plays the guitar. Okay, uh, so we went through all these complications to be able to work with corporal uh, and do mainstream natural language processing tasks. And here's what we've been doing in these 10 years of this research program. So um, at the beginning of the talk, I showed you this ambiguation for words. For example, draw could mean pull or sketch. This method now enables us to in, uh, extend this, this ambiguation to phrases and sentences. And we've shown that, in fact, it becomes much easier at the level of sentences, obviously, because you have more context. Now, what you want to um, disambiguate is still your verb, draw, but you have the verb in a sentence. So a man draw a sword, has a vector, we build it as described before. Then this will be 
close to, if it's close to man's sketch sword, then you know that it's about pulling. And if it's close to a man pulled the sword, sorry, it's about drawing, sketching. And if it's close to a man pulled the sword, you know that it's about pulling. Uh, so we formed a lot of different data sets in these different papers, experimented with these vectors for this ambiguation, and it works really well. Um, at the time, we managed to beat the baselines of just adding the vectors and uh, word-only baselines for this ambiguation. Once we were able to talk about ellipses in this paper in 2019, we actually didn't work with any logic, just resolve the ellipses with hand. We could also extend these data sets to uh, this, ambigu this um, ambiguous phrases that have anaphoran ellipses in them. Here's an example. The man drew a sword, the artist too, right? Uh, then you're quite sure that this draw is sketching because the artist is doing it too. And the man drew a sword, the samurai too, then this is like much more certain that this is the pulling meaning of the sword. So the more context you add, the easier your disambiguation becomes. And being able to deal with coreference enables you to add more context. You can even go beyond sentence limits. So here we also did some build these vectors, did experiments, and got really nice results. Um, I'll show them here too. So here you see one of our best tensor models. Um, this is degree of correlation. And goes between minus one and one. The minus ones mean no correlation. The pluses mean positive correlation. And you've got here quite a long correlation, 0.5. Often there is disagreement between what you are calculating correlation with, which is human judgments, and the top thing is about 0.7. So it is actually not a very low number. And if you com compare it with, verb only vectors. So if you don't take any structure into account, you'll see that it's the, at the best 0 0.41. If instead of the vector of the word, you take into account its tensor, so it's a much more uh, complex structure, much richer, but still no context. It's verb only, it goes to 0 0.3. If you add them, it's 0 0.4 again. Uh, if you multiply, Point was multiplied them 0.32 and so on and so forth. So our tensor model is actually 2009 could still outperform some uh, nice baselines. Now the results of this paper enabled us to go higher than this 0.5. You see here we've got our best model is 0.65. Uh, what is interesting is that before we reached to this point, we wanted to work with vector space and linear maps. There was no way you could copy using a linear map. Uh, so we did approximations of linear copying using Frobenius multiplication, for example, which gives you a form of basis copying. And so the current results are much better than the previous results, which is a relief. But also, uh, you know, they're better than verb-only tensors and verb-only vectors. Uh, we didn't manage to beat the additive model, unfortunately, here. But the state-of-the-art neural phrase embedding BERT, this gave a very low result. So we, we managed to beat this, but I mean, it's a one-off. Okay, I'm going to then finish by... Uh, talking about some open questions and give a literature review. So obviously the biggest problem, theoretical problem of the setting is that vector spaces are sound, uh, but they're not complete. We have this syntactic category, which is sound and complete, but it doesn't mean anything, couldn't find any nice examples in other settings. So our quest is now to find complete models. Uh, I mean, a personal quest for me is to be able to beat deep neural network uh, baselines. Here you see we've beaten BERT, but didn't beat the additive uh, based on, so I'm, I I'm not quite sure how reliable this uh, beating of BERT is. Then also it would be nice to automate the parsing uh, and sort of not, be, not do it by hand, have a learning algorithm that guesses what has to be copied and permuted and then parse the sentence for you. Uh, so just, I'll go through a literature review. The history of this thing was interested. 
before going to Lambeck calculus, we worked with something called Krigor grammars, which were very close to compact closed categories. Um, then later we found that you can indeed work with Lambert calculus. And then Lambert calculus is not the most popular between people who do large scale natural language processing. Uh, the work of Mark Steedman in Edinburgh, uh, combinatorial categorical grammar CCG is quite popular. And indeed some people develop very nice vector space semantics also for CCG. So you don't actually have to work with Lambert calculus. You can work with a wide scale uh, grammar as well. Uh, then I've sort of played with the idea of applying it to other grammars, like lambda grammars, abstract categorical grammars, they work. Dynamic syntax of Gabay and Kempson works. Then Mordgott's modal lambda calculus, a very different type of modal calculus works. Uh, Jager's modal calculus works. Uh, and we've also worked with lambda calculus with the relevant modality, but just that it was undecidable and finally we settled on this recent version. And then um, I want to say that what's possible is uh, that we've recently had a paper to learn these tensors using representation learning. It's, it's a neural network algorithm, but it's not deep. So another possibility for further research, but this is very hard to develop a deep neural network algorithm to learn our tensors. And so we would then automatically beat the deep neural network um, baselines. And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.